whether or not life can exist on our planet. Now, you may remember I said that the other planets have a deciding factor in whether or not life exists on our own. And the reason for this is that the other planets in our solar system also have a circular orbit. And the significance is that if they had an elliptical orbit, like you see in this bigger planet out here, you can see it's actually an elliptical orbit, it would pull the Earth into an elliptical orbit as well. And you understand the ramifications of that, that basically we would lose the possibility of life on our own planet. Another feature to think about the planets and the role that they have with us is the whole problem of comets and asteroids. That there is a continual stream of, if you take asteroids, I think they can be very simply described as very small planets, and they're bombarding our solar system with irregular monotony. And it's said that the planets in the inner part of the solar system protect the Earth from an awful lot of hits. Now, the Earth has been hit, and there are places you can go to in the world where you see enormous craters where comets or asteroids have hit. But the thing is, it is considerably rarer than what ha other planets. And this is a classic example where you look at the moon and it looks like somebody with a severe dose of acne. All the pot, pot marks, you see that? And that's one of the, the craters seen at higher magnification. And it's an indication that the moon has saved us from an awful lot of bombardment by asteroids. Okay? Now you move on to comets, and I found comets rather interesting because I was very naive. Now I should say at this point one or two things. One of them is I am not a, an, astrono an astronom astronomer. I can't even see the word. Astronomer. I'm, I'm coming into this as somebody who knows very little about the subject. My, I'm, ba I'm a basic scientist in the biological field, and it's only through reading of this stuff that I become aware of some of these features. And I naively assumed that when you looked at a comet, the tail of the comet indicated the direction in which the comet was flying. You know, when you look into the sky and you see a jet leaving a vapor trail, well, you can see, you know, the jet's moving forward because the vapor trail's behind it. But this is not the case in comets. If we do a wee diagram here, you would imagine that the comet is moving from the left of the screen to the right. But in fact, this particular comet is moving from the bottom to the top in a clockwise fashion. And the tail is actually caused by radiation streaming from the sun, which blasts away at the surface of the comet, forming this fiery light. Now, comets are, they don't tend to hit the inner part of our solar system like asteroids do, but they certainly do hit a lot in the outer part. And I think some of us are old enough to remember the comet Shoemaker-Levy, and there was, there was, it was in the newspapers the possibility that it could hit planet Earth, and if it did so, that would completely wipe out life on our planet. But what actually happened was it got taken in by, I think it was Uranus, I can't remember which planet, one of the bigger planets, it got too near, and it got sucked into the planet by its gravitational field. Now, the reason why I mention comets is that they reckon that comets have a very short life. They're measured in a matter of a few thousand years. And that's created havoc with the idea that the whole cosmos must be billions of years old, because how do you explain the existence of comets if they're only a few thousand years old? And they come out with this tentative theory, which at the moment has no proof, that there is what they call an Oort cloud. And this is the solar system we have here in the centre. And this Oort cloud is well outside our visual range, so we cannot see the Oort cloud, not even with the Hubble micro, uh, telescope. And this cloud is continually producing new comets and asteroids, and that's why you have comets and asteroids which are a few thousand years old. Now, at the moment, there's no substantial evidence that that is actually is true, but that is the theory. I should also mention that the Moon has upset calculations quite considerably because... They have noticed over the last 30 years, and it's now accepted, that there are volcanic eruptions in the moon. And the significance of that is that it means that the core is still hot, which means that because of its small size, it cannot be anywhere near as old as what they thought it was. It must be an awful lot younger. Probably, I don't know if they're talking about tens of thousands of years, but certainly not the sort of numbers which they have been using to describe the age of the 
the, the cosmos. Now to turn our attention to the sun. You used to read in textbooks that the sun was an ordinary sun. It was nothing remarkable. You won't read that in the textbooks anymore. It's actually one of the larger suns that exists in the, the cosmos. And its size is very, very important to whether or not you can actually have life in its solar system. Now, if you have this situation where the sun is smaller than what we have, in order to get the benefits of light from that sun, the planet has to be closer to the sun. But there comes a point where the planet gets so near to the sun that it becomes what they call tidally locked. And what I mean by that is, um, if you were to imagine, uh, so we say that the sun was there and I was Earth. As I rotate around the sun, of course, I'm actually rotating all the time as I'm going around it. But when you're talking about a tidally locked planet, it faces the sun as it orbits the sun. It never changes its face. And of course, this is exactly what's happened with the moon relative to the Earth. We always see the same face of the moon. You never see any other face than the face which is seen every day, every night. Although, of course, in Scotland you can see it every day because there's so little un sunlight that you see the moon anyway. <laughs> I, by the way, I don't have, I'm not a member of the, the, the Scottish Tourist Board. I don't actually sort of, you know, <laughs> not doing a very good selling job for our, our country. Now, the, the significance of being tidally locked is that the surface which is actually facing the planet, uh, facing the sun, would be cooked. The temperatures would get very high. And the surface on the other side, of course, has the extreme opposite, where it gets very cold. And it's basically incompatible with life. Now, the other problem of small suns is the small suns are red dwarfs. And I think it's something like 70% or more of suns in the cosmos are, ca are categorized as red dwarfs. And the big problem of these red dwarfs is that they are very unstable. They do not produce the same amount of sunlight consistently. And what they actually produce, of course, is what we call solar flares. Now, our own sun also produces solar flares, but they have so little impact upon the average energy output that it changes only by something like 1%. So there's very, very little fluctuation in the sun's energy output. Whereas when you look at lead, red dwarfs, it's much, much greater than that. Now, these are examples of solar flares in our own sun. Now, the problem with the red dwarf is that you are so close to that sun that when these solar flares come out, they produce masses of radiation that completely strip away the atmosphere. So, one good blast of a solar flare and you cease to have an atmosphere on your planet. And, of course, that means no life. Now, of course, we do have this problem to a smaller measure on our planet. And I'm referring to the northern lights or the aurora borealis which you can see here it's a very very spectacular example that was taken from a canadian airbase and this is where uh, the sun's irradiation as a solar flare has passed through the the, um, the vacuum if you like and has hit the earth and always gets pulled into the poles of the earth and i'm sure many of you have seen drawings of the earth of its magnetic field and that the magnetic field always pulls into the north pole and into the south pole so that if you have any um, radiation energy, these, that energy gets pulled into the poles and not into the centre. But as it passes through the atmosphere, it does do damage. Just so happens that we're the right distance and the sun is of the right stability not to have any appreciable impact upon the quality of our atmosphere. Now, this is a, a photograph of um, an eclipse where the moon has completely eclipsed the sun. I find it utterly remarkable that the moon is exactly at the right distance from the, between the earth and the sun as to form a perfect eclipse where it literally fits exactly the size of the sun and you're just seeing the solar flares of the sun popping around the edges. Now you could call that coincidence but I do find that rather a remarkable coincidence and I would suggest that it's a, an example of scripture where it says that the heavens declare that the glory of God or the handiwork of God, it's almost as though God is saying, I'm here. And this is an evidence of it. I'm showing you that it's not just an accident. Things are just beautifully balanced. Now, the reason why I show you this is that to speak about the sun itself. As I said, it's very, very stable. There's only about 1% changes in its energy. 
And it goes through a solar cycle of something 